All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Leadership in the Moment. I'm Tim Huff, and this is brought to you by Turknet Leadership Group. This is a special podcast here. I'm, uh, I'm producing this on location at the U.S. Military Academy here at West Point. And I've been invited here by uh, Colonel Todd Woodruff. So, Colonel Woodruff, can you explain what you do here for West Point? Todd Woodruff, I'm, uh, so I teach as part of uh, my responsibilities here, teach leadership management courses, and I'm the director for the West Point Leadership Center and the Eisenhower Leader Development Program. The Leadership Center is really focused on, on leader growth and character growth as it relates to experiences, new knowledge, capabilities, reflection, coaching, mentoring, and, and helping accelerate the growth of our, our young men and women who are, are, you know, developing leaders. On the Eisenhower Leader Development Program, it is a graduate program in organizational social, social psychology that is co-taught, co-run with the Columbia University Teachers College. And, uh, and we're really focused on educating our leader developers, our tactical officers, and other folks that are are tied into uh, taking the science of leader development and leadership, and using that knowledge to build our our future leaders in terms of the cadets. So, you know, and I, I find that really interesting as you and I were talking earlier about leadership character. Go, you know, at the Turknet Leadership Group, we have a very solid foundation of integrity, and our leadership character model is based off of uh, respect. And responsibility, and I found it really interesting that there's a lot of parallels on a lot of the things that you teach our uh, our, our future warrior leaders on what it means to build a leader of character. So, what, what are some of the things that uh, that you do to uh, to help develop those kinds of characteristics, whether it be instruments or uh, or the kind of classes that you teach or the models that you go into? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it starts with understanding what does it mean to be a leader of character, and I think that is. It's, it, frankly, it's different for, for different professions, different societies, different cultures. You know, for us, it, it, you know, we tend to anchor on uh, integrity, honor, honesty, personal courage. Uh, you know, we have our army values, respect, you know, loyalty, selfless service. We also know that in, in, uh, in the military, particularly you know, in the army, uh, where we are putting people in harm's way, caring is a big deal, right? So, so being a, care, a, a caring leader, somebody who can connect with, empathize, empathize with, and, and understand the needs of their, of their followers, of their soldiers, is really important. So we help them understand what are those character attributes that are valued by the, the institution, valued by there are followers uh, that help build trust. And, and once there's an understanding of that, then we can move into helping the, the, those growing leaders understand themselves, see mm-hmm. themselves, understand where they're at. What are those things that those character attributes that they're strong in, those that they still need some work in, and, and understand where they're at. And once you've, you've done that, then you kind of can see this is this these are the kinds of constellation of character traits that we'd like to have developed here's where you are and what is it you know what does that gap look like and and then that's when you're at a position where you can say what are are the interventions what are the experiences what are the you know the new knowledge uh, capabilities the reflection mentorship coaching that's required to be integrated to get us from where we're at here to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And how you do that is it's a little science and it's a little art, Mm -hmm. frankly. And it's fascinating that you have that level of mastery, that level of professionalism and so much of this body of content at the undergraduate level here at West Point. I mean, you've developed this program that's absolutely fascinating. And it's interesting to see all of the parallels that we have with, uh, with corporate America and the the, some of the things that we're trying to to inculcate into people on leadership character. So it's truly fascinating. You know, I, I was really appreciative of the fact that uh, Colonel Woodruff was uh, was kind enough to allow me to sit in on one of the seminars uh, to the undergraduates uh, earlier today. And it was uh, this particular seminar was on organizational change management. And I believe you were talking about um, Cotter's eight steps of, right. of uh, change management. Can you uh, tell our audience what that was about, Vince? Yeah, so I mean, our approach is, is really grounded in two theorists. One is 
Edgar Schein, who really helps you understand organizational culture. So what are what are an organization's underlying beliefs? What do they espouse in terms of their value system? And then what are the artifacts in that organization? Meaning what are the actual behaviors of leaders, followers? What do the, what do the membership do? So we look for incongruity between any of those levels or perhaps a mismatch between what we do and what we say we value and the needs of the environment and what makes organizations successful. Any of those things would, would identify a need for change. Uh, once you've identified the need for change, then we usually use Cotter's eight steps uh, to, to kind of drive that. And, you know, there, it doesn't, it doesn't work perfectly all the time, but generally you are focused on developing uh, a compelling need that is shared and acknowledged by the team that is responsible for that change. That is, anytime there's a major change, there's, there's inherently resistance from people who are comfortable with the way things were being done, who don't see the need or threatened because maybe it requires new knowledge, skills, or abilities under the new system. Maybe it indicates if they were a leader that something was problematic that was under their watch. So all kinds of reasons. So you really have to, to share a compelling need and a sense of urgency on why we need this, right? right? Otherwise, you're just going to be perceived as somebody who's changing to, you know, you know, make a name for themselves or, you know, because they're the new guy, they, they you know, they kind of you know, feel they have to. Yeah, I just got to, got to do something. So, so you create the sense of urgency. Um, generally, we say build a guiding coalition. That means, you know, oftentimes it's it's your leadership team. Sometimes, though, there's informal leaders. Sometimes it's co-opting the people that you think are going to be most resistant and bringing them close and, and helping them get behind the change because you've trusted them and you've brought them in that loop. But you have the guiding coalition that is necessary to, uh, to have the influence uh, broadly to enact that change. And then once you have that, it really comes down to creating the vision, you know, that desired end state that you want, communicating it effectively, and then empowering the organization to take action on it, right? So there's all kinds of stories of people uh, in organizations where they, they say, this is what we want. Uh, and then when people actually start acting on that, in some cases acting on it and failing or trying something new to get their, uh, their, you know, their slapped down or corrected or something like that. So as a leader, we have to say, how are we empowering them to take prudent risk? How are we encouraging them to, to get, you know, to, to take that disciplined initiative to reach the you know, desired end state? Uh, and there's a lot of things that, are, that go into that, but ultimately you as a leader have to identify what are those very discrete things that are going to be empowering. Sometimes they're removing bureaucracy, sometimes they're making sure that the resources are available, sometimes it is, it is um, underwriting risk and failure uh, when, when it's in the pursuit of that desired end state. Uh, and, and then it, it really starts getting into things like gaining momentum. So you want to create short-term wins. So, you know, sometimes you've empowered stuff, but you really want to accelerate your movement towards it. So finding some opportunities that demonstrate movement and dem demonstrate success uh, from the change mm -hmm. will help build some momentum, overcome some, you know, some of the resistance that's still there. And once you've got that, then it's really, it, you get into this situation where you have to uh, empower additional change, anchor the change that's occurring and make sure that, that once you kind of have it where you think it needs to be, that it, it, it is going to be anchored beyond your tenure. As leaders, you know, we, people, you know, come and go, but if, if you want change to be enduring, it has to be kind of written into their, to the culture. It has to be enduring as part of, as we socialize people into, into the organization, um, policy procedures, you know, who do we promote? Uh, who do we reward? Those kind of things need to be aligned with the change that has, has occurred. And it has to continue to happen. Like you're talking about organizational habit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, those things that anchor the change then become part of the habit. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have those anchoring mechanisms at the end, uh, 
you know, hiring the talent that is aligned with that change, rewarding people that, that have made it possible and continue to promote it. If you're not doing those things, then, then the habits are still there. The gravitational pull is still back to the status quo. And if you as a leader step out and move to another, another responsibility, another job, the tendency is for the organization to kind of snap back mm -hmm. to where it was, even though you've made all this positive Progress. movement. Yeah. So you have to make sure that that these things have a life beyond beyond the leader's tenure uh, and become part of our DNA and part of, of how we produce the next generation of team members and leadership. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of parallels to the things that happen in, in, uh, in corporate America and in the private sector. There's just so much change that always is happening, and if we're to adapt some of these uh, some of these these principles that have obviously been uh, been effective, that uh, they could help drive well, a lot I mean, more effective I mean, change. Frankly, it's because I mean we might have different criteria for success. One might be national security, other might be uh, profit or some other some other indicator. But uh, but ultimately, the same the same mega trends, the same kind of global environmental factors that are causing organizations to change in the private sector are also causing change in governmental service and military and social nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, you know, population center shift is some, age, you know, some become more of age, you know, and others, uh, you know, maybe other populations are shrinking. Technology is, uh, is growing in certain areas and, and, and pushing our, our efforts in certain directions. As leaders, we have to recognize that, recognize its impact and the opportunities and threats that are created by it. Mm -hmm. You know, and those things are true, you know, whether it's, you know, for example, you know, we, today we, we had this, you know, Fran speaking on uh, the impacts of artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, those are impacts uh, that occur across industries, across Absolutely. countries, you know, they're, yeah. they're going to affect all of our lives going forward. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So Colonel, I want to uh, shift a little bit here. Um, you and I were talking earlier about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And something I, I found really interesting. Uh, so, you know, at, at Turpinet Leadership Group, we have a certification program and a concept called IDEA. It's inclusion, diversity, and equity in action. So the overall concept is we help companies not just talk the talk, we help them understand what it means to actually put this into action and create a DEI kind of capability. And we have a certification program that's uh, is absolutely one of the best in the industry. And we have a uh, one of our, our our senior consultants, Dr. Cherry Collier, mm -hmm. literally one of the best in the industry around this whole concept. Um, but I found it really interesting that the, you and this organization has been able to incorporate a lot of the DEI capabilities and, and concepts into uh, the curriculum, into the uh, uh, the culture that you have here. Can you speak a little bit about to, uh, a little bit to that? I mean, fundamentally, the United States Army is a values-based organization. And one of our fundamental values is that all we treat all human beings with, with dignity and respect, right? So all, all people are deserving of that. And, you know, so <clears throat> we, we having that as, as an underlying value, uh, we also recognize that, that we are a performance-based organization. For us, winning matters. Winning within our value systems matters, right? So winning with honor matters, uh, and and we need we need the best and the brightest. We need the talent that is going to take us into you know into the neck the forthcoming generations, and that talent right now is you know it is it's resident across a diverse population, uh, and you find talent regardless of of gender of race. And we, we need to be very clear that our leaders have to be inclusive. They have to be, they have to build a team that is cohesive, that, you know, functions at a, at a high level, but it brings in, um, it brings in people from all walks of life. What unites us is our values, mm -hmm. right? So we have a common set of values. Um, we have a common purpose in, in why we're here, and and that brings us together. That allows us to have unity, and purpose, and and frankly, you know, we owe it to the nation 
to find the best and the brightest. Uh, and that transcends, as I said, gender, it transcends race. Mm -hmm. And our leaders have to be effective of bringing people in from across the country, from across the globe, um, from across cultures and building them into that, into that team. So, but I think it goes back to um, if, if you treat people with universal dignity and respect and you seek and develop the talent mm -hmm. that, that uh, you're, you're always in, in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, we also value diversity of thought um, and diversity of talent and capabilities. So, you know, the most effective teams are those that, that bring together complementary viewpoints, complementary uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities mm -hmm. to, to, you know, to be able to uh, address a range of challenges and a range of needs for the organization. So we, we definitely have, um, we have a, a number of programs mm -hmm. that, that focus on that. But, but fundamentally, it still comes down to helping people, uh, and in this case, building leaders of character through experiences, exactly. through uh, developing knowledge and, and capabilities, and providing them the opportunity to reflect on those experiences and that new knowledge, make sense of it, and understand how it's going to be applied going forward, and having a, a, a robust set of mentors and coaches. And you know, one of the things that we find unique here is that the people that we're mentoring and coaching themselves will become mentors and coaches in a very short period of time. So they need to be comfortable not only being mentored and coached by by you know a diverse group of people, they themselves need to be comfortable coaching and mentoring a diverse group of soldiers and and and, and build those leaders themselves. And understanding what that means and I, absolutely. And you said something earlier that I thought was really profound because it kind of summarizes so much of what you're talking about. Winning with honor. You know, you're always about the performance, but you also do it with honor. That, that's a that's a really profound statement. I like that. You know, Colonel Woodruff was kind enough to uh, afford me a little bit of a tour here at this incredibly historic uh, location that I'm in. Uh, obviously, it's so much history here, so much fascination about uh, the stories behind the stories and um, the, the, the beautiful weather that we happen to have here on, on this, uh, this day that I happen to be here. Um, but I, I want to ask you a question. What would you say is one thing that people would be really surprised about with regards to uh, West Point? So... I love West Point. Uh, I poured my heart and soul into it. And uh, I, I would think, say that, I don't know if people would be surprised, but they would, I think they would be deeply impressed by the, the talent that is here in terms of our, our cadets, in terms of the, the leader developer constellation that is, is supporting them and helping develop them. Uh, and, you know, we talked about this earlier today, but, you know, I'm always impressed by uh, the success that our, our female leaders have here. It is, it's not long ago that, that women were structurally prohibited from serving in combat arms. Um, so it's, it's re a relative recent change, um, you know, in, compared to our overall history. And, you know, so at, as the population of women has increased at West Point, uh, we've seen that they are routinely competing and sometimes out-competing others for key leader positions and that they are at the top of their class when you start looking at academics, physical, military, uh, and character, that they are among our, our, our top graduates. And I understand that there's a very disproportionately yeah, represented the top at cadet, that level. The top cadet right now is, is female, right? Yeah, she yes. is very, very impressive and that's, that is... You know, it's fairly routine at this point that that uh, our our top cadet leadership are represented by uh, a by very strong female leadership, and mm -hmm. and she's earned it. Trust me, she's great, mm -hmm. very very good. That's great. That's great. Leadership character is alive and well at the United States Academy Military Academy here at West Point, and under Colonel Woodruff's uh, tutelage and instruction is obviously going to be something that's not just inculcated here right now for the next one to three years, for generations to come. We're going to see 
some of the warrior leaders of our nation coming out of this program based off of the leadership character models that you're putting in place right now. So Colonel Wurgis, thank you so much for being with us here and leadership in the moment. And thank you for the opportunity for me to come here and talk to you and, and get an insight into how you build leadership character here at West Point. So appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for your service. Absolutely. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. This is Leadership in the Moment brought to you by TurpNet Leadership Group. And I am Tim Huff. Until next time.